Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for the second session. I'm Jackie Dugard from Vitz and from Seri. Um, unfortunately, in this session, uh, Yasmin Suka and Denise and Sebeza could not make it at the last minute, but we are very fortunate that we have Vern Harris, Noreen Tulsi, and Mary Rayner. Um, so I think we're going to have a very interesting and robust conversation. Vern Harris is the Director of Research and Archive at the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Um, Lorraine Tulsi is an independent journalist and is writing a book on the Marikana <coughs> Commission process. He's been very involved from the outset. And Mary Rayner is at Amnesty International. She's a researcher there. She's been involved with um, researching, monitoring, uh, and exposing human rights violations in South Africa since 1987. And as she said to me, she has had the privilege of working with um, many of the people here as parents, as activists, and then their offspring as well. So she has, has quite a, a, a long history of working in human rights in South Africa. I'm going to kick off by asking everybody, this session of course is about the legacy of the TRC or after the TRC, so we're trying to join um, processes and experiences, learning legacies from the TRC to Marikana and beyond. So I'd like to ask each of you to please give me your thoughts and reflections on the legacy of the TRC in terms of both the positive and the negative, but particularly obviously in the context of South Africa that we are acutely aware that we are an increasingly unequal society, um, possibly an increasingly violent society. We have examples every day of violence against women and children. We have had uh, experienced only in the last week or so uh, xenophobic violence. Um, the real question is, has the TRC in any way delivered a successful transition? And um, I would like to particularly ask Vern and start with you about the legacy of Madiba and ask you a tricky question there that you might weave into this. Many people are now beginning to criticize um, Madiba and say that part of his legacy was to favor reconciliation over accountability and justice. And is this something that we are grappling with now? Thank you. I think that the uh, reconciliation project that was conceptualized under Madiba's leadership is largely misunderstood. Uh, it wasn't only about the Truth Commission and nation building, it was also about a whole range of special instruments for redress and reparation from BE to special pensions to land restitution to the land reform program and so on, all uh, long-term interventions. Uh, implementation, of course, has been uh, inadequate. Uh, to what extent that was Madiba's responsibility and to what extent it is the responsibility of the administrations which have followed is, is, a, is a debate. I think the other element of the reconciliation uh, strategy was the restructuring of the economy. And if, if, if anywhere uh, you can point to failure and shortcoming uh, in terms of his leadership, this is this for me is the key element, is that we haven't seen that uh, restructuring of the economy. In fact, we've, we've, we've seen, if anything, uh, what I would call a, a seduction of the liberation movement leadership, including Madiba by capital, and uh, a neoliberal <coughs> agenda being implemented, which I think is, is fundamental to understanding everything that's happening in our country today. But in terms of the Truth Commission, just perhaps one uh, <coughs> comment. I think that it established a good springboard for continuing work, but that work has not been done. And as we look back on the Truth Commission, I think we have to see it as one in a long history of commissions of inquiry here in South Africa. And I'm talking about the Colonial Commission of Inquiry and commissions under the apartheid state, where these commissions were hardly ever a complete sham, because they were never a serious instrument of accountability and transformation, but they performed a very important function for the state. Um, in other words, to measure 
the extent to which adjustment was needed in order to accommodate resistance, to accommodate um, discontent. And I think this is now the way we are forced to look at the Truth Commission, is that it has not been a meaningful instrument for transformation. It's been about adjustment. And I think uh, our fear just has to be that the following Commission is going to be just another such instrument. Thank you, Noreen. Um, <coughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, for me, I think one of the striking things that I'm trying to grapple with now around sort of the legacy of the TRC um, is, is around perhaps how it rendered um, a lot, I mean, I wouldn't say, um, yeah, how, how, how it rendered a lot of the, the black experience of apartheid um, unspeakable almost. You know, there was, um, there was a performative aspect to the TRC, it was sort of, uh, um, a lot of it was on television broadcast, um, you know, I mean, um, and the mechanics of that sort of almost almost reduced the black experience to sort of, uh, you know, uh, if you got a hug from Desmond Tutu, then, you know, it, it, it was going to be okay. I mean, obviously the TRC had uh, not just what we call the victim hearings, um, and the media exposure um, that uh, has just been mentioned of the victim hearings, but it had closed hearings in which uh, evidence was provided which gave insights into how violent repression was organized. And some of that information is just going to be coming out in public soon. Um, secondly, the amnesty hearings. And the amnesty hearings raise a question of inequality of access to justice because uh, um, that has uh, plagued the Americana Commission. Um, um, one of the conditions of applying for amnesty uh, well, obviously was a full disclosure which um, there are many uh, analyses that show that full disclosure didn't happen uh, in probably the majority of cases. Um, and secondly, that the person or persons applying for amnesty could have legal support. Now, there was no systematic legal support for um, people who wanted to be represented in opposition to the grant of amnesties to uh, perpetrators. Um, it was NRC and other organizations who stepped up to the table to make sure that uh, Peggy Langeni's family and others could uh, have a say in the process by which people who committed atrocities against their relatives <coughs> would be checked in terms of the version that they were trying to present to the Amnesty Committee. There was a very disturbing um, aspect also which I think contributes to repetition currently. And that is if you, I mean, I did an exercise for something that Amnesty published, which was to go through every single Amnesty hearing involving torture allegations. <coughs> and the Amnesty committee continued longer than the other committees, um, which is an interesting issue in itself. Um, and if you go from the beginning of the hearings uh, relating to an application for Amnesty or <coughs> torture, allegation to the end uh, and the end process in which um, there was a lot of pressure under the Mbeki government to get rid of this process we wanted over and done and dusted. So you see um, um, a decision making process by the Amnesty Committee that gets shorter and shorter and the scrupulousness about checking whether the version given by the applicant um, is, is truthful. So towards the end, uh, there are also a granting amnesty in cases involving torture allegations in which um, they are essentially agreeing that politically motivated or sanctioned or ordered torture uh, is not a crime uh, and can be amnestied and of course it's used Kogan's uh, in relation to torture. So this was a huge breach for South Africa to take. And it's not surprising that torture continues to be committed in this country, and sometimes for political reasons, and not just uh, crime combating 
if I can say the word just. The last thing I wanted to say related to corporate accountability, um, and people probably know about the prolonged battle in US jurisdictions to try and get accountability of some of the uh, corporates that operated in various capacities in South Africa. And uh, they've got bottomless pockets. Uh, the US uh, court system is a complete insane nightmare. Um, and that struggle is still continuing through the various jurisdictions in the US to try and establish uh, some aspect of accountability and access to reparations. And on the reparations issue, um, I think one of the very distressing aspects which may go to the current uh, context we're talking about, and that is, I think, an extremely mean-spirited approach that was taken at the end of the major part of the Truth Commission on the issue of reparations, in which um, uh, politicians publicly denounced um, victims who had been classified as eligible for <coughs> reparations agreed to uh, by the TRC process, denounced them for being primarily interested in money only. And I think the people who were saying it were people who had access to political authority and access to nice jobs, um, and they'd forgotten what it was like to have no resources and to live with permanent disabilities and so forth. And I, I suspect it's this is sort of echoing around in this current context about um, uh, avoidance of state acknowledgement, and there will be a long battle to get civil repar reparations. I think in the Americana context. Thank you very much. So, so building on that, I'd like to ask you each to give us your thoughts on the issue of justice and accountability and, and the legacy that we uh, have regarding that from the TRC and moving to the Marikana Commission and also the issue that Mary has raised about reparations. Um, what, what can we learn from the TRC? What has it bequeathed us on this? Um, and what, what can we hope from the Farm Commission? I think the uh, the Truth Commission rested on a very particular economy of exchange, a trade-off, if you like, is that amnesty will be offered to perpetrators of human rights violations in return for full disclosure. Those who do not come into that process, who do not fulfill the requirements for amnesty, will be prosecuted. And the other part of that economy was that those who are victims, uh, victims as identified by the Commission, will qualify for a whole range of reparations. And I think that as we look back on the Truth Commission now, what we see is, uh, is, a, is a terrible failure to respect that exchange is that the reparations have been inadequate. The, we, can, we can deconstruct the amnesty process. Uh, no time for that now, but I think what we have to um, highlight is that effectively a blanket amnesty has been given. Because during the the years immediately before the Commission was established and then during the duration of the Commission, which was 95 to 2003, there were a handful of prosecutions, <coughs> de Kock being one of them. Now, I might, I might be wrong, but uh, <coughs> in my reckoning, since the end of the amnesty process in 2003 and the establishment of a special investigation unit, uh, to embark on these promised systematic prosecutions, we've had two prosecutions. Now, we see in, in many countries, and you, you, you mentioned Argentina, is that um, if you avoid this difficult work, and nobody, I think, would argue that, that it's, it's straightforward, it's unproblematic, systematic, 
prosecution of thousands of perpetrators. But if you simply avoid that work, but more particularly, if you hoodwink the people on this question, because I think South Africa has been hoodwinked. There has never been a statement by government that, well, we've decided not to <coughs> prosecute. There's been no explanation whatsoever. In the same way that there's never been a formal response by government to the TRC final report with its recommendations. We simply walk away from these things. And I think what you see in countries all over the world which have been through long periods of oppression, conflict and so on, is that a deep-seated rage simply grows within society and cultures of impunity grow. And I think that's what we're seeing in our country today. And I think that the, 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 the connection between uh, that inheritance, the inheritance of the 1990s and our failures to, to reckon with the past adequately, uh, are, are directly linked to Marikana, what happened there and what will inevitably happen when this commission is wrapped up and we get some kind of response to the report. Thanks, um, <clears throat> I tend to focus a bit more on Marikana um, and the Farm Commission. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think I'm, I'm probably going to echo some of the stuff that was said earlier today, but um, I mean, the way things appear to be sort of formulating it, um, it seems very obvious that we'll never know to what extent um, the discussions around sort of moving to start to tactical phase three and uh, stage three on the 16th and deciding to sort of uh, <coughs> to move in on, on the 16th, how high up it went, whether way it was discussed with regard to sort of ministers and, and, the, and the presidency, etc. But I mean, it, it seems very obvious that that the National Commission of GECO is appears very expendable um, and but I mean would there be is there going to be greater accountability it would appear not I mean a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the police leadership on Marikana and the, at, at Marikana on August 16th um, appear to be promoted since then and some of them have budgeted themselves before the commission um, you know and I mean I think one of the big failings of, 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 of the farm commission has been well, I mean, Fulham initially um, divided the, the commission to fa into phase one and phase two. And the phase two uh, part of the commission was going to look at sort of um, really really get stuck into the structural issues around sort of migrant labor. Um, and, uh, and, and those sort of things have not been fully addressed. And, that, and that's, for me, that's, um, that's an important sort of deficiency because um, it was an opportunity to really sort of um, attempt to address and um, and re-examine sort of how our economy is run, what it means for you know, poor rural black people when it, you know, uh, uh, who have their, 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 their families sort of completely broken up and you're subject, subjected to sort of a, a, a process that is dehumanizing, uh, emasculating for males, um, you know, I mean, uh, it's uh, these sort of, these sort of these are very important questions that we should be asking of uh, how our economy and our society is structured, which um, the Commission would have allowed, um, which hasn't happened because of the time frames. There's an intimate justice that they deserve, but there's also a broader justice that I think is required for, for, for our country and especially sort of you know, rural communities, which, um, which um, the one sense is that um, the Farm Commission will not, will not address. So. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, sorry, can I also ask you to to focus on one thing that I haven't raised up until now? Why has there been this failure to prosecute sex? Uh, there was an attempt to put in place a new policy document, uh, which would have provided for finishing off the amnesty process behind closed doors. Uh, and without um, access uh, to directly affected um, victims, families, and so forth. And that was successfully combated by um, uh, public interest law groups, including LRC, uh, in the courts, uh, which uh, finally led to a ruling that the policy was completely unlawful and couldn't stand. Then that seemed to have been followed by Chinese whispers um, 
down the down the hierarchy that there will be no prosecutions of past perpetrators. Um, and the battle to combat that uh, secret policy, which is, uh, I think you said, it's not been explained publicly. We're not going to do it for the following reasons. That's, that's still continuing in the courts and in specific cases for which um, prosecutable evidence exists and the <coughs> suspected perpetrators of torture and disappearances are still alive. <coughs> Um, and it goes to the problem of political interference in decision making because uh, you can only explain it in political terms. People who have no role in prosecution decision makings are saying, don't do it. Um, and I think as everybody in the room knows um, that we've had a further deepening entrenchment with widespread effects of uh, interference with decision making on who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. Um, and there are various examples that can be in the current domain in which the extent of political interference and decision making is creating chaos amongst prosecution teams and uh, amongst investigators and uh, it's very hard to tell whether investigation teams are acting autonomously or they're being directed in some kind of way in so many cases now. Um, a question that's hovered around uh, the discussion around commissions of inquiry uh, in 2012 as opposed to other approaches um, has been what would we have started with if we didn't have a commission of inquiry set up in 2012? Um, well, we would have started with IPID as the Criminal Investigation Authority uh, in relation to the police at least, um, but would not have covered issues relating to corporate accountability. Some of the issues discussed in the late session yesterday. Um, um, and the history of that oversight body from the late 90s until currently has been one of tremendous pressure and the failure to have it answerable in setting it up to um, someone other than the Minister of Police. Um, and the current debacle around Robert McBride is the latest manifestation of, of uh, the difficulties, even, and you do, have good investigators within IPID, um, uh, of their capacity and freedom to conduct a proper investigation. And I think We've got to come back to that again once the commission report is out because um, that's going to be the body that's going to be picking up its deep freezed early start investigation to try and breathe life into it again. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I just give um, one, one moment each to, to, for final, final reflections? Um, thank you, Jackie. I just um, wanted to pick up on Jim's point. Um, and I think it goes back to, uh, in part, um, to observations uh, earlier this morning on the lack of preparation and thinking about the experience of the bereaved families, the people who are injured, a whole range of people affected, and a kind of avoidance of recognizing that we have people uh, in the room who've been affected by human rights violations and human rights abuses, taking into account some of the other deaths. Um, and I, I feel that previous commissions, and this is the experience in other countries other than South Africa's TRC, has had that tradition of including people who've had direct experience of what it feels like to be caught up uh, in repressive or other circumstances and um, it goes also back to perhaps the privileging of legal information um, that has dominated the commission experience. Thanks, Niren. Um, I was in the spirit of the last days of the commission going to sort of horse trade my time away but then, but I mean maybe <laughs> I should respond to um, uh, Jim as well, I mean uh, maybe with another question um, as to sort of yeah just the uh, 
the demographics of the commissioners? I mean, why were they appointed? I think that's an interesting question, and who they are and their background, I think it's a really interesting question that we should maybe consider. Um, uh, I mean, I don't want to be reductive, but I mean, President Zuma has a habit of uh, appointing judges to commissions who have found for him in some way or another. Uh, Chris Nicholson to um, the, cricket, the, the Cricket Commission um, uh, <coughs> Farlam, Farlam wrote a dissenting judgment at the SCA um, around um, I think there's the search and seizure applications by the NPA, and he sort of found himself a gig at, um, at another commission. Um, Hemraj and Tokota are probably a lot more interesting as well. I mean, just in terms of, sort of uh, I suppose, the Chinese whispers around uh, police briefing patterns and um, and yeah, and uh, you know, Pakistan sort of, uh, prosecution histories, etc. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that they they they. Personality-wise, professionally, they're interesting choices as commissioners. Um, just uh, a quote uh, that I, I thought was so apposite, both in relation to the Truth Commission and to to the Truth <coughs> Commission. Um, and this is a is from a text by Hugh Kirtler, written in 1972. He's writing a review on on Hannah Arendt's um, work on violence. And, and what he said is, once authority has deteriorated to the level of mere power, the next move to actual violence is no longer a moral problem. It is a matter of survival. And I think the structural violence that we experience in our society today is, is what we're actually needing to do. Thank you so much. Do you guys think there is actually enough political pressure on the government to take the recommendation seriously? when the commission is finished. Um, thanks. I do not have any direct experience uh, or detailed knowledge of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. But what I do know is that the commissioners had direct experience of what happened during the apartheid period. I know, for example, that the Misa went to prison for four years. And I'm sure that the experiences that all of those commissioners had during that period informed them and directed them as to how they were going to operate during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that really is a big plus. When I look at the Farnham Commission and I see, does anyone there, any of the commissioners, have any experience at all of what it's like to be a miner working underground, living in the shacks? We all know what the answer is. It is a resounding no. And that is a defect and perhaps <coughs> something that we could have learned or should have been learned from the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. So we end up with three lawyers who effectively have no experience. Now, the trouble about lawyers is that most of them think they've got some God-given right uh, to pronounce on every single subject uh, in the universe. I don't think that's right. I think if they'd looked around and taken into account what had happened in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they might have come up with other alternative commissioners who had some experience or at least had done some research. I mean, I've read stuff by a man called Gavin Hartford, and I thought, well, he sounds like a good guy. He could have been a commissioner. He sounds pretty good. He sounds pretty evenly balanced. He seems to uh, advise the mining houses. He also seems to advise the trade unions. I'd give him a bit of a, a, bit of a tick, and perhaps Callie Forrest, I'd give her a bit of a tick too. Uh, but, uh, so I think that was a big defect, and that seems to me to be something that could have, uh, could have learned. Because the consequence of it is, is this. When you sit there and you sit at the commission, and even when you go to other functions, you know, what, you te what I tend to pick up is that people look at what happened through the eyes of authority. You know, the police did bad, we've got to change that. They didn't do this right, so we've got to change that. And, and of course that is right, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be done. Of course that should be done. But whoever looked at it through the eyes of the miners, even when it comes to the language that is used, the language against the miners and the strikers is incomparably more harsh. And you look at what happens to them, say for example, no one turned around and said, what were the miners thinking about on the 13th when the following had happened? On the 10th, they'd been attacked on three separate occasions by Longman security for doing absolutely nothing. On the 11th, Noam had tried to murder them. On the 12th, and here I don't seek to exonerate what happened to the two guards, that were bloody awful uh, there, but on the 12th, they were attacked yet again by eight London security. And on the 13th, an unprovoked attack that murdered three miners. Imagine Mr. Noki going back to the mountain after all of that, and he's trying to address them, saying, for God's sake, what's going on here? 
were being attacked, were being killed, were being murdered. No one looks at it through the eyes of the miners, and that is one of the problems about how the Commission operated. And it just seemed to me that looking at the experience of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, some things could have been learned. Thank you. In terms of political will, a uh, difficult one to answer when we haven't seen the recommendations uh, in the report yet. But I think it, 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 it's instructive to go back to the, the question of why there haven't been prosecutions uh, following the TRC, which becomes a question around will there be prosecutions coming out of the uh, Foreign Commission report. Is, is for me, uh, the reason why we haven't seen systematic prosecutions of apartheid era perpetrators is is a combination of three factors. On, on the one hand, the, the principle of equivalence, which was implemented by the Commission, was profoundly offensive to significant sections um, of the ANC, and particularly for Thabo Mbeki. <coughs> so that what we saw was when the new administration moved in in 1999, the, the, the state's approach to the Commission just changed completely. Uh, but I think a direct link to what that principle of equivalence would have meant for prosecutions is that perpetrators within the liberation movements would have to have seemed to have been prosecuted as well. And that became a, a, a hot potato politically. I think the second factor was that already that process had been compromised by the appointment into positions of power <coughs> of people we know were perpetrators. Utilesi and Cabinet, Neil Barnard, senior government official, and so on and so on. But the third one is, a, is, is, is what I would call blackmail by former state operatives. Um, we, I don't know if any of you have read this book that Neil Barnard's just published. It's clear that he has access to uh, intelligence records, uh, and without naming people, he constantly infers that people in senior positions today are deeply compromised and that that information could be made available very easily. So the political will just wasn't there to begin implementing a systematic prosecution. In relation to the Fallen Commission, if, if the recommendations include things like transforming the political economy of the platinum belt, holding uh, Lonman and other mining companies accountable, transforming uh, our SEPs, uh, these deeper structural um, imperatives, then I don't think there will be any political will at all to implement them. Yeah, there certainly wasn't any political will to, by the Department of Minerals to exercise any oversight over London social labor plans. Um, so yeah, um, oh, questions to answer. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there are a lot of unanswered questions around Marikana, and I'm coming back to Mr. Magiriwana's question, you know, I mean, who will get prosecuted and who will get accountable, who will be held accountable, um, and, you know, I, I, when I was thinking about it, I, I mean, I was just, I, I remembered um, the three, three, three people who were killed at scene one on August 16th, and that's uh, Mr. Yona, Mr. Mr. Vinze uh, and Kevisile uh, Yawa, whose dad is here today, um, they were killed by, by shotgun pellets. And uh, I mean, SAP's banned using shotgun pellets for a long time. Um, who, who, which of those policemen decided to take shotgun pellets to, to Marikana on that day? And what was their intention? I mean, those sort of questions then sort of raise real questions around sort of premeditation and, 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 and what, what individual policemen wanted to do on the day. And, um, Will I mean there was uh, there wasn't enough forensic capacity to to, to sort of um, to, to track where bullets and which which bullets came from which guns etc. I mean so you know yeah I mean will police be held accountable individual people leadership um, even people in cabinet etc. I, I I think not I mean I think it's been very much Pierre has a scapegoat and I mean she's expendable she'll get a new job in a couple of couple of months time somewhere else um, it'll be fine but um, yeah the inherent structural and sort of like sort of and uh, specific uh, accountability I, I don't really see it happening so. thank you um, just
Just to picking up on uh, Niren's uh, issue there on the shotgun pellets, um, one of the things we were involved in assisting with in partnership with others um, was to try and track the relationship between um, to do additional ballistics work because the first round done officially uh, there was only, well, I'm not going to comment, uh, but um, uh, there were difficulties in relation to those kind of weapons that were not handed in at all. They were not handed in uh, for the official investigation. Secondly, there were 9mm pistols that were not handed in uh, for investigation. Um, and uh, so you had a complete loss of a vital piece of evidence for ballistic examination, just not in, in the mix for the analysis. Um, then, then you uh, had the impact of high velocity uh, rifles. Uh, again, that was something we had some involvement in supporting the work on. Uh, which cause huge damage to the body and um, there's fragmentation uh, which creates a difficulty of relating the fragments to the weapon fired. So at a level of evidence, um, establishing individual responsibility in relation to the shooters will be difficult. <coughs> and other people have already commented that uh, with two exceptions, uh, no shooters were called to give evidence and be put to the test. Um, on the, um, the political issue that I think um, Byrne has raised, um, um, there was a very interesting encounter between de Kock and President Zuma that went on for some hours in the prison that Eugene de Kock was in until very recently. Um, and I, I think it's okay for me to say this, but prior to that encounter with President Zuma at the prison, uh, de Kock was cooperating with the families uh, who still wanted to know what had happened to their relatives who disappeared, where their bodies were buried, who else was involved in the incidents that resulted in their deaths. But after the encounter with the president, um, there was no further cooperation. And only those two men know what happened in that conversation. Um, on the political will, just one further comment uh, to the questioner. There are other very significant cases currently going on in which um, the political will disastrously relates to which grouping is in charge of prosecution decisions or pressure on prosecution decisions at the NDPP level or at the Hawke senior level and so forth. And this is creating a very volatile environment for prosecutions of cases that are going to be inherently difficult anyway. So um, I, I think it's going to be a struggle and I think I mean, various organizations have already identified the need for a prolonged campaign to stay on the backs of the authorities that you can't drop the ball on this one because your whatever interests might be badly affected. Thank you. Um.